In confusion and uncertainty, there emerges a guiding light, a beacon that cuts through the darkness. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello, and welcome to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. You're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Um, it's always a joy to be with you. And uh, I, we're getting more and more people listening every week, uh, which I'm absolutely grateful for. And so just want to remind you, the purpose of the show here is to bring people to a deeper love and intimacy of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith by doing one thing very well, that is speaking the truth in love, as St. Paul admonishes us to do in Ephesians 4.15. And in our culture today, we know that truth is not a philosophical construct or an idea. Truth ultimately is a person. In John 14, 6, our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I say that because in our culture today, for example, this, this whole thing about the pronouns, calling one person they, you know, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and, and if you, and, and I just came across someone the other day that they were offended that I didn't call them this one person they. I said because you're one person. I mean, I'm using logic and common sense here. Uh, and, and so what the culture tries to do is tries to uh, to influence the way we think by taking words and redefining them, like marriage, which comes from the, the word matrimony, matri. Monium, which literally means like literally the word means the state or condition of motherhood. So if you want to redefine marriage, you have to change what words actually mean, right? Gender, you have to change what words actually mean. And even now pronouns, you have to change what words actually mean. So they're trying to change reality in order to um to to make their point, to get their uh uh you know, to get people to think the way that that they do. And those are things we have to resist as people of faith. You know, it's a, not about disrespecting people. It's about actually respecting the fact that we're all made in the image and likeness of God, you know. Uh, but even in the midst of all this insanity uh, going on, we have to stay focused on the truth. Who is Jesus Christ? Um, and today we have someone on, <laughs> you know, in, in fact, sometimes what's happening in our culture is so ridiculous and and it's just laughable. I mean, it really is. And uh, to help us to uh, laugh more <laughs> uh, when it comes to our faith, that you know, maybe not take. Um, well, the faith is serious, of course. We're talking about eternal salvation here, but there are things about our faith that we could just laugh at. Sometimes you just have to laugh at yourself, you know. And we have one of the most unique people to help us do just that. His name is Chris Paget, and. Chris and I have been friends for a long time. We actually met each other for the first time at a Steubenville conference uh, where we were both speaking. And so we got a chance to meet in person. And he is one of the most unique Catholic speakers, authors, evangelists that you ever want to meet. Because you have people like myself. I'm a speaker, right? So I, I go out there and I and I speak and that's what I do. Then you have uh, people that are, that, um, are musicians. Right. So so they articulate the faith and they uh, evangelize through music. John Michael Talbot and uh, uh, folks like that. You know, so many different types of musicians. Ace McKay, right. Our producer does that. Uh, and then you have um, people, people that, um, you know, share the faith through uh, comedy like Jennifer Fulweiler. Right. Uh, Jenna, she's great, by the way. She's awesome. But now she's do, doing comedy tours and things like that. But the unique thing about Chris Padgett, he's he does all three <laughs> you know? and he's extremely well educated, too. But, you know, he has this very unique way of proclaiming the faith and witnessing to the faith, which is which is very powerful, very unique combination and skill set. And so we're going to talk to him today, and the, the, the really we're going to talk about faith can be funny, you know, our our faith can be funny. So again, even in the midst of all the stuff going on in our culture, it, it's sometimes it's just so ridiculous you just have to laugh. <laughs> so you will be part of the program today. Send us an email, beacon at ewtn.com. and uh, this show is brought to you by some great people. 
working behind the scenes at EW10 Radio. We have Matt Kabinsky screening calls. We have Charles Beery doing social media and our producer, Ace McKay. Ace, how you doing today, brother? I'm good, man. I, I hope as we talk about faith is funny, it's a reminder that God does have a sense of humor. People tend to think he's a very serious God. And, you know, every day when my bones creak, when I get out of bed, when I try to have the perfect setting for a romantic night and something goes awry, that's God reminding me that I need to stay humble and that he's in control of what's happening around my life. That's so true. That's so true. And, you know, sometimes I think it's, it's a good thing to laugh. I mean, I, I you know, some people just take the faith so seriously. They just can't laugh. They're like everything has to be serious all the time. Mm. Um, you know, but, and, and the thing, see, the thing is this, I mean, I, I'm not a person that likes surprises. My wife does. Right. right. But I'm not a person that likes surprises because life gives you enough surprises, right? There's enough things in life that you, that you have no control over, sure. you know? Um, and so, so I don't worry about those things. And sometimes, you know, with the weight and the heaviness, you just have to just lighten the mood. And there's nothing wrong with a little good humor and, and some laughter. I yeah. think that's I think that's a good thing. I think that's a healthy thing. The 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 interesting thing is trying to balance that with faith. Right. You know, because people think, well, there's apologetics and there's uh, you know, the the uh dialogue with the Protestants, you know, they don't, you know, we have to try to debate and all this stuff to try to convince each other that we're both right. Um, uh, but there's, I think there's another way, I think a way that we're actually missing is to make connections, our faith through laughter, hmm. you know, and, and, yeah. and through not mocking the faith or making fun of the faith, but, but bringing certain elements uh, of the way we live the faith, the way we witness to the faith that are just, that are just funny. Sure. You know, and uh, and I think it's I think it's good. Sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves. Yeah. Well, and I think that's so many times our faith gets treated so seriously. And I remember growing up, you know, in a Baptist household where, you know, you didn't laugh at anything funny. Like the first time I heard a Christian what would be deemed a Christian comedian and he's making fun of things in the Bible. And my parents are, you know, laughing and ha, you know what? And, and I was like, OK, so we can laugh. And in church, we can laugh in our faith. Like that was because up until that point, it was all, you know, everything is methodical and you have a monotone face and don't show expression. Like, and so that was huge. And I was like, okay, well, if, if we can have fun and still love Jesus and laugh together and play together, I'm, I'm in like this, you know, like before it felt very much like a box. But the thing I love is God is all these multi-layers, just like we are multi-layered. You know, so if we are godlike, why wouldn't we be able to do all of those things? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I, you know, I don't. I mean, I do inject some comedy, but it's always based on like when I'm telling a story, like a real life experience, right? You know, and it, it, I inject some comedy, like when I talk about the birth of my daughter, and when I saw her crowning, her head came out. And the fr I just freaked out, man. And I just tell that story. People just start laughing because yeah. they're like, oh, my goodness. Especially the guys like, oh, my goodness. I felt the same thing. Like, I experienced yeah. the same thing. And it's just funny. Or even spontaneously in a homily. I remember once I was preaching. I was giving a homily at mass. And church was full. And I was, I was like, oh, men and women. And then a baby cried out. Like, <laughs> I said, babies to everybody in the pool. And everybody started laughing, you know, yeah. because it was funny. Sure. You know, it wasn't taking away anything from the gospel. It wasn't taking away anything from the homily. It was just one of those spontaneous moments. The baby cried out as I was saying, you know, it just, and I just took that moment just to, you know, spontaneously just, you know, include the, the, the kid and in, in his laughter into, yeah. into part of the, the homily. It was, and it was, it was great. So you know I have a mean? question and, for and you. That's like you're not, it's not deliberate or doing it every time. You know, because, you know, uh, uh, St. Paul says we're supposed to be admonished by what we hear um, uh, in the homily and in the preaching. But still, when spontaneous moments come like this, go with it. It's OK. Now, when you tell stories, have you ever embellished? Well, um, no, I mean, I don't lie about it, but right. you know, I may ex exaggerate a little uh, okay. a point, a true, a true thing in order to make it funny. Yeah. But no, but I, no, I don't lie about the things that I, yeah. that I talk about. That's I what do. I mean, because my Maybe wife loves bit, to call yeah. me out. Yeah, my wife calls me out something that happened to us on the weekend, and then I share it on the air. And she's like, you know, it wasn't just like that. I go in my head in the moment. <laughs> it felt like that was the big thing. 
And she's like, okay, yeah, embellisher. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, uh, that's great. That's why I'm so looking forward to this uh conversation with with Chris because I mean think faith can be funny. Um, and so we're gonna look at that. We're gonna talk about about the a little about Chris's journey and his education and background and how he's able to balance all those things so very well um to be an effective uh evangelist. So um really looking forward to to talking with him. And so of course we come back, we're gonna break God's word open in the Psalms. And remember, the next segment of the show, the Soulful Psalms, are now its own podcast. You can go to Podcast Central at EWTN.com. You can go to Spotify or SoundCloud or your favorite uh, iPod delivery to get the uh, to hear the show. More Beacon of Truth, we come back. that i love that nice riff too on the guitar there heavy distortion there's so much distortion in that like that. it's it, it's like rustic like you're like mm. <laughs> say tugga, 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 that, that, see there's two ways you can play that you can play it kind of like tugga, 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 like a staccato like moving the pick up and down yeah or you could just tugga, 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 like a machine gun kind of thing you know because nice. i've seen john petrucci for example from dream theater play uh, he played in fact in a concert he played um uh, what was it it was uh a song where he does he played it two different ways okay um uh, when it is it, it, a set of four and two times he played it one way and two times he played it another way it sounded exactly the same it's I very cool it. all you got to yeah. do is get a looper man in the oh yeah. in the presence of enemies that's what it was in the presence of enemies, okay which is a 20 minute song by dream theater by the way <laughs> well, and when you need that, you know, perfect lullaby, dream theater for 20 minutes. You know. yeah. wow. uh, awesome. Well, this show is brought to you by some great folks, uh, including Ace McKay. And uh, we're excited to have Chris Paget to talk about faith can be funny. But uh, you got some things to remind us today, Ace. Yeah, just want to let you know, make sure you can stream if you have an Apple box like I do at my house. All of our homes have the EWTN app, so you can uh, stream not only television, but radio shows anytime from home. Just make sure you have that high-speed internet connection, and you are good to go. All right. Well, when you hear that music, it means it's time for us to break open God's Word in the Psalms. Of course, we're using the Revised Grail Psalms, which are approved uh, for use in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass uh, by the U.S. Bishops. It is prepared by the Benedict Monks of Conception Abbey. And today we're going to look at Psalm 4, right? So the fourth Psalm, so it's in Book 1, Psalms 1 to 41. Of course, this Psalm was written by David. Now, this Psalm is typically prayed during night prayer or uh, Compline. Uh, as it's called, as we call it in the monastery, Compline, or it's the last prayer of the of the uh, of the evening. So, this is after vespers, right before you go to bed, you pray Compline, and this psalm is always included as part of Compline, Psalm four. The prescript is the entire first verse of the psalm. It says, "For the choir master, with stringed instruments, a psalm of David." So David wrote this psalm. And he wrote it with having stringed instruments in his mind. So, uh, and then he gave it to the choir master, which is the musical, uh, the um, uh, the musical guild of the Jewish temple, for them to put music to it. All right. And so the psalm starts: "I called, the God of justice gave me answer. From anguish you released me. Have mercy and hear me." So I love that. He, he, he was rec he's recounting now his calling out to the Lord and the Lord answered him. And what how did the Lord answer him? By releasing him from his anguish and having mercy upon him, right? So that's that's one of the ways that we know that God heard us. Not It's not like a genie, like I give you three wishes, you grant the wish. No, but but God lets his will be known through um, through the actions of our lives, through the circumstances and witnesses of our lives. 
um, he lets us know that his will has, has been done uh, in the way that he wants that unfolded. So, so the way that God answers our prayer is not the way that sometimes we think <laughs> uh, that he should answer or the way that we wanted him to answer it, but he answered it in the best way that will draw us closer to his most sacred heart. Right? Then he continues, children of man, how long will my glory be dishonored? Will you love what is futile and seek what is false? See, now he's saying, look, everybody, look, look at the example that I give. Don't follow yourselves. Don't follow what the culture says. How long did he keep doing this? You know, he's, he's, he's asking, how long are you going to uh, uh, wallow in the pig pen of foolishness, basically, right? Living your life away from God and away from his will. And he continues in verse four, know that the Lord works wonders for his faithful one. The Lord will hear me whenever I call him. So look, he goes, get away from your foolishness. Get away from focusing on the ways and the thinkings of the world. No, and look, and look at my example. Know that the Lord is the one who works wonders. The Lord is the one who is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, the Lord will always be faithful. And he hears me whenever I call him. I love that. Tremble. Do not sin. Ponder on your bed and be still. Offer right sacrifice and trust in the Lord. So sometimes we go to bed or we end our day with stress and worry and, and fear and trepidation and anxiety, which is one of the reasons, uh, uh, by the way, that I always end my prayer in the evening uh, with a novena, right? And I've been praying for the past two years or more, the surrender novena, the surrender novena. And the surrender novena ends with, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything that we say uh, 10 times after the, the novena prayer for that day. You know, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. That's basically summarizing what David is saying today. And he, I love this. Verse 7, what can bring us happiness, many say? Lift up the light of your face on us, O Lord, right? Striving to live face to face with God when his will is united with our will, longing and looking toward that beatific vision, life with God forever in heaven, right? That's what we should be striving for. That's what's going to bring us happiness, seeking the things of God, not the things of man. You have put into my heart a greater joy than abundance of grain and new wine can provide, right? So, so in other words, the joy that God will give us is greater than the joy than anything on this earth can or will ever provide us, right? And then finally, in peace, I will lie down and fall asleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So David goes to sleep at night with the confidence with the confidence that he is not alone uh, in, in his striving to, uh, to, to, to uh, follow God's will, that God is with him, God will strengthen him. If he continues to do God's will, if he continues to live in the way that uh, God calls us to live, and for us, the way Christ calls us to live, that God will allow us to dwell in safety. That doesn't mean there's not going to be hardship in life, but God will always be with us to give us the peace to give us the joy that will uh, ultimately lead uh, to him, to, to the greatest joy, being with God forever in heaven. And on that note, speaking of joy, I want to now introduce everybody to Chris Paget. And if you've not heard of him, uh, I don't know, you must be living under a rock or something, you know? So, I mean, Chris has been doing ministry for, for well over a decade now. Um, he uses, again, he has a, a, a master's degree from Stu from University of Steubenville. So, you know, see, he, we know that intellectually he's well-formed. He uses, he's a, also an a, a excellent musician, which is great because both Ace and I are musicians. We talk about music a lot on this show. As you heard in the music beds, we, we, we play uh, a lot of uh, great music. So music is also a part of what he does. Um, Chris entered the Catholic Church in 1999. So he's a convert to the faith. He's married. He has nine kids. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, he's he, again, brings a very unique flavor and color to the Catholic speaking world. And so I'm so honored and blessed to have him on the show today. Well, welcome to Beacon of Truth, Chris I love Padgett. It. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thunderous <laughs> applause. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the truth is, I, I knew when we had the chance to sit together and talk and kind of get to know a little bit about one another that I, I met pretty much a family member. We're, we're very similar on so many levels and um, appreciate the honor to be here today. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited. So um, and one of the things you were saying earlier really was resonating with me, which was um, the idea of joy and the importance of joy. And I always tell people whenever I'm doing parish missions or doing talks, you know, why would anyone want what you've got if you don't even look like you want what you've got? And I think there's a real bizarre idea that severity is equated with holiness. And in fact, I think it's not the case at all. I think it's um, joy. I think jo joy is the tell that something is different in your life. And uh, we're we're in a very bizarre uh, period of time right now. It's like we're, we're and you spoke about that in the intro, that we're really struggling to to define and clarify what we mean and, and what life is about. And we see the just kind of the rogue behavior of an indifference towards, you know, kind of a basic understanding, a logical understanding. Uh, but we cannot forget the importance of joy in this whole process because, you know, information is not what usually is transforming the life of an individual. It's a relationship yes. with someone that sees them and loves them. And um, I have found that joy works wonders. No, absolutely. Uh, and we're going to we're going to break that wide open in the next segment. But for the couple of minutes that we have left, Chris, um, the people that don't know you now, I, I mentioned you came into the church in 1999. So tell us about that faith journey. Now, how, what led you to uh, the Catholic faith? I usually, as a joke, will say, why did I become Catholic? So I could drink, smoke and swear, which is, of course, <laughs> not. I don't do, do any of that stuff. Um, but the truth is, is that uh, I felt like a compulsion that I had to when I started doing a deep dive and a study about why Catholics do what they do, why Protestants did what they do, I realized that there's an authority that is given in the Catholic Church that is unprecedented in the Protestant arenas. I mean, you can have a denominational allegiance, but even then it might be a pastoral allegiance. Like it's a little fickle. And at the end of the day, you're all pretty much your own independent authority. And in the Catholic context, obviously, uh, we're given that consistency of faith and morals. And what a sigh of relief that was for me, because I didn't have to understand the fullness and the complexities of everything. And um, I could have a sense of peace and knowing that God was going to guide the church and 2000 years of consistency made all the difference, you know, and I grew up in some great denominations and am so thankful for that upbringing, but to receive the Eucharist and to uh, find myself nestled in the consolation of that consistency is uh is the peace that i had been longing for no oh, that's awesome and so um so you come to church so what led you to want to get that degree from steubenville like what push because a lot of people that come into the church don't think oh i'm gonna get a master's degree and study theology at a deeper level so what <laughs> motivated you to do that i was and have been fascinated with biblical studies for much of my life and so when I graduated with my undergrad uh, in English literature, I knew that I wanted to dive deeper in my faith. And I actually got accepted to a program in um, that was kind of housed in Scotland and things were looking good. But I thought if I could if I could go to Franciscan, that'd be amazing. And they were just really getting rolling the distance learning program. I, of course, like everybody had heard all this stuff, Scott Hahn and Steve Ray and, you know, the the Lighthouse Catholic Media, but before that it was St. Um, Joseph's Communications. I just gobbled all that up and I thought, wouldn't it be great to go there and learn? And so one day I said to Linda, let's, why, why don't we sell our house and move to Steubenville? It was insane. But we put the house on the market. Two weeks later, it sold and we were on our way. It's crazy. It was a crazy time in our life. 13 years in Steubenville, got my degree, got to teach theology at Franciscan for four years as an adjunct, spoiled rotten, great people. And I loved, I loved it. All right. And so, but now you're in Kansas, right? 
No, uh, well, I was just in Kansas doing a comedy show for a ministry there. Ah, but okay. I, I live in New York, in central New York, ah. um, north of Syracuse. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this is great. Well, Chris, uh, when we come back, we'll have uh, more and we'll, we'll break open your story more. But I'm, I'm fascinated to hear how you put that all together. So more of Beacon of Truth. We come back. Beacon at EW10.com. Sometimes you just gotta get funky on Beacon the Truth, I tell you. That's right. We're learning to laugh, we're learning to be funky. Eye opening experience. <laughs> Excellent. Where you listen to Beacon of Truth, I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And uh, so great to be with you again. And we're talking with Chris Paget, speaker, uh, author, musician, comedian, bringing it all together, bring people to a deeper love of Jesus Christ. If you want to be part of the program today, send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. And uh, another great musician uh, who's with us every single day bringing you this show is our producer, Ace McKay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, we want to let you know about a podcast at Podcast Central, one of our newest to the edition, uh, Ways of the Father. It's actually uh, giving you insights into Christian history. So if you want to check that out, easy to download. If you, of course, prefer Apple or Spotify, you can always download that anytime and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. But easy to find at EWTN.com slash podcast. All right. Well, in this segment of the show, we're talking with uh, my good friend, Chris Paget. Chris is in the last thing we heard, uh, came into the Catholic faith in 1999 and got his master's degree from Steubenville and has just embarked on uh, an incredible journey of bringing people to a deeper love and intimacy of Jesus Christ. And I have Chris on the show because unlike any, because I, I, I mean, I've, I'm around speakers all the time. I've been speaking professionally for a, a very long time now. Um, and, but I've never seen anyone kind of put the elements together um, the way Chris has done it's a very unique way of of uh, articulating and, and and sharing the faith, and he does so again through uh, presentations, conferences, parish missions, uh, and comedy shows, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, Chris, welcome back. It's great Thank great you. Uh, for you to be here. It is amazing to be here. I'm I'm super honored, and I love you. I love listening to you talk. I could listen to you talk for hours and hours. You're so gifted and um, and uh, and really, it is a privilege. Thanks for letting me be a part. Oh of today. no, this is this is great. I'm so glad that you're here. So so when you were thinking, so so you got your degree from Steubenville. You 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 lived there for 13 years. You taught there as an adjunct, and you moved to New York. And so, what made you say, okay, I want I'm going to be a speaker, and I, like what? Because um, I I told my story on the show before of how I got to go from my law enforcement career to doing this full time. So what made you want to uh, share the faith at, at a professional level? Uh, yeah, well, I did the band first. Um, it, it, the band, you probably heard of it, it was called Boys to Men. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not the band. Uh, the band. Well, tell us about the music. Tell us about your interest in music and and how you got into the band? Because I mean, this we we talk a lot about music on this show. Yeah. So, so when I was a kid, uh, my parents got divorced, and, and I think in some ways, my mom was trying to figure out what what can I do to keep this kid from breaking things and being insane. And so, music was a real big connection point for me. We had a piano in the basement. I used to just kind of mess around with it and almost write my own songs. Uh, I never really liked practicing my piano lessons, but I but I loved writing music in a way, even as a little teeny kid. I remember being introduced for the first time to the Beatles, really by my father. And that was a pretty transformative experience. That and like the Beach Boys and Jan and Dean, these old kind of 50s. The thing about it was I was super fascinated with the way that harmonies worked, even as a kid. Um, I remember trying to play the guitar, but my fingers, I was too small. And um, so long story short, music was kind of a place that it was a refuge where I could go when things were crazy. And I found that I could remember stuff that I liked. And then I started putting things together 
when I got to high school, I started writing songs. And of course, you know, the idea of writing songs that might be a love song, something even experimenting melodically. But what was weird about that was even then I found that I could only write about what I was most passionate about, which was faith. So even my earliest songs were about like a relationship with Jesus. It was crazy. Uh, and I was scared to play a lot. So I really just played by my, you know, like to, for myself, I'd recorded on little tapes one day, you know, after writing a million songs, um, I started getting the nerve to book some bands in the area. And I thought maybe I'll get the nerve to book myself. And as a result, uh, I ended up booking myself at some places and a person who uh, listened to my music, said, I like what you're doing. He knew how to record things. He was great at guitar. We started a band, Scarecrow and Tin Men. And um, and then we were picked up by a label um, who had heard our music and wanted to be a part of it. It was crazy. Um, I, I Wait, felt, so what, what instrument did you play? I wrote uh, most of my songs on piano and guitar. Okay. But in okay. high school, like I played trumpet and, you know, I could probably pick up most instruments if I needed to pretty easily. It was just kind of the way my brain worked. Not math, not science, but English and music, you know, kind of more of a creative expression. But I, I found that the experience of recording in like a national, like N Nashville studio was like, you know, a drug for me almost because you could bring to fruition what was in your brain. Like I was always horrible about recording my own stuff. I have a million demos. They're all pathetically bad, but I loved when I went into that studio, they're pressing the buttons, they're getting the most out of it. And I remember when I heard this song, probably our most famous or popular song was called You Are My Son. And when I heard that for the first time after we professionally recorded it, there was something in my brain that was like, this is exactly what that song was supposed to sound like. And I really ultimately could have just recorded music 24 seven, but the live show was a very cool experience. And there's something about when a musician with a band goes out and they work together, there's a complementarity and a camaraderie. And you might even be uh, having opposing viewpoints and perspectives, but when you get on that stage, something incredible happens. So we we did that for years and years. We used to do tons of diocesan youth rallies. And it's really part of why I became Catholic, because the band started doing all of these diocesan youth rallies. And um, I was exposed to the Catholic faith. And as a result, I mean, I basically started asking, why do they believe what they believe? And why do I believe what I believe? And um, yeah, so ultimately, at the end of the day, I became Catholic and uh, much to, to the complete horror of some of my family members. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And, and so um, so you're a musician then you come into the Catholic for you get a master's degree. What made you decide, to, again, to be a speaker? So you did the music first. And so it, it seemed natural then to incorporate the music as a Catholic now with your your, your yeah. master's degree and kind of incorporate that into the way you present the faith to people. So what made you want to do that as a career as opposed to teaching English or teaching music <laughs> or something right. like that? Well, I, it's funny because I knew I had gotten a scholarship to play in college for music, and I knew that I did not want to do that because the last thing I wanted was to be a band director. I'm grateful for my band directors, but that was not what I wanted. What I wanted was to write music, sing music, do music. And so I did. The truth, though, is that um, nobody knows I'm a singer, or musician anymore because I don't do that anymore. I'm, you know, kind of old and I realized that things were changing. My great joy during a concert was really at the end challenging and encouraging people and inviting them into a relationship with Christ. That was my passion. So whether I use music or comedy, storytelling, you name it, I still teach. I teach with Catholic uh, International University, and um, I taught at Franciscan, as I said. So I still love teaching the faith, but my great passion and joy uh, is as an evangelist. I want, uh, you know, I I want people to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's my greatest desire. So I will play the fool so someone will embrace Christ, and I will um, deflect and defer and let someone have the pride of place so that they can um, maybe for the first time hear the message of God's love. I mean, at the end of the day, all of the stuff that you know, people try to make a career on, I look at as tools 
to um, invite people into something that is the most profound something that a person can have, which is that relationship with Christ. I love my band years, but honestly, and I still write music, prayer type music, and I still do a little music at missions and such. But my my passion is to, and I know this, I think it's a spiritual gift, I think, that probably you have and other speakers have, which is I know if I tell this story or if I repeat this phrase or if I maybe play that chorus one more time, that something spiritual is going to happen. Like, I don't know how to explain that, but I know that something will break and I will have permission. And that's the big part of this is that I'm looking for someone to give me permission to share with them the most important thing to me, which is Jesus Christ. And so comedy works a lot for me with people who are struggling to find how the church plays a role in their life. And um, so faith-filled Catholics can bring their secular or friends who have walked away to my events and they might find themselves laughing and thinking why am i having fun at this concert or or for example hearing a song that challenges them i remember uh i was on a plane and there was a very wealthy man sitting next to me and um he decided he was going to come to my event that night which was a little scary to be honest because i don't know him but he's coming and he brought his mother who's really old and uh, they sat in the front row practically. And he came up to me afterwards. He goes, I, I was crying tonight. It's the first time. And his marriage was about on the rocks. Uh, his family was very secular. He was lost. And I thought, this is way beyond my ability and skill set. I mean, this is what happens when you let God work through you in your smallness and your weakness. And I, I am addicted to that. It's literally, I think, why Paul would say, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel, because there's something inside of me, and I'm sure in you, that says, this is what I'm made for. Yeah, absolutely. You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and we're talking with Chris Paget today, a passionate evangelist and speaker uh, about faith and comedy and music. And, and so, um, Chrissy, so you talked about the intellectual formation, the teaching, you talked about the music and how that was a, a part of, of, of your evolving way of presenting the faith. But what about the comedy piece? When did you know that you were funny and then now want to not just incorporate comedy to your talks, but now an actual comedy show that you that you're taking on the road? This was a little challenge. Well, first of all, I've been trying to make my parents laugh since I was a fetus, practically. I just, my grandmother getting her to laugh. Like there was something as a kid. And honestly, in school, I <laughs> I got into trouble all the time. Not because I was horrible and, and a bully, but because I wouldn't stop talking. If I could make my friends laugh, then I won for that day. So it's always been a part of my thing. And in fact, right before 2020, I was going to do the I've been weird my whole life comedy tour. I was going to rent out some theaters and do that stuff. And then, of course, 2020 hit and the life you know, of, the, of that was going to not happen. Well, I remember some friends of mine from the old days when I was a kid in South Dakota, they're like, Chris, we this is exactly what we all thought you were going to be doing anyway. So like it's kind of fitting that you're getting ready to do this tour. The point, I think, at the end of the day was for me that um, the wrestling match I had with myself was not, do I want to make people laugh? Because even at a parish mission or at a, an event, a men's conference, I love making people laugh. The question was, though, can I live with myself by only making people laugh? <laughs> yeah. And so I realized, and I I told this the other day to a friend um, and a person that had seen a comedy show that I just put on, I said, the problem is, is that in the secular arena, I'm not going to be as secular and as insane as they would want me to be for me to maybe move up that ladder that way. And uh, in the in the religious arena, um, some of the stuff's a little bit edgy for some people. So it's a real bizarre, like tightrope walk for me. But I love seeing someone laugh so hard that they have to catch their breath because then I know at the end, and I do this even at all of my parish mission comedy events, and even I do a lot, just did this for a nonprofit organization, they're raising money for their ministry, I did a comedy event for them for that night, even at the end of that, I'll do something serious that 
invites them to see the reality and the meaning and the purpose of who they are and the invitation to be in that relationship with Christ. And I have a feeling even if I did secular clubs or if I went to the theaters and had people get tickets and go that way, there still would be a meaningful ending because I can't, I don't think I can just live with myself and only make someone laugh because it's good in and of itself, but it's not for me, as authentic as I can be, which is it's going to turn the corner. It's not a hard sell in terms of you have to come to Jesus moment, but it's an invitation. And that's I look at like comedy stuff in a lot of ways, like it's pre-evangelistic. And you know what I mean when I'm saying yeah. that there are uh, pre-evangelistic events, evangelistic events. And then we got to get into catechetical and discipleship kind of dynamics. We spend so much time on the catechetical and discipleship yeah. focus that we forget and just assume everyone's already got the basic lingo, but they don't. We had yeah. better start working on pre-evangelistic and evangelistic or our churches are going to be empty. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, it's about how do you engage someone who's not engaged? But you can't start off talking about let's break out the catechism. And start. They have no idea what you're talking about. They don't right. have the language. They don't have the the understanding. They don't have the relationship to, to be able to even understand what you're talking about. So you have to find a way to draw them in. So I think your approach with the comedy is ex exactly a wonderful way to draw people in so they want to listen more. I, I think one of the most effective things about apologetics and people say, what's the goal? They think the goal is to win. I'm like, no, hmm. the goal is this. How do you get this person standing in front of me to want to listen to more of what you have to say? That's the goal. Right. And I think you do that so very well. Uh, you know, we're talking with Chris... Oh. But we're Sorry. talking with Chris Paget. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, host of Beacon of Truth, and you're listening on EWTN Radio. And uh, go ahead, Chris. I mean to cut you off there. Chris. No, you're awesome. I the thing I was thinking about is that my son, who's super passionate and interested about apologetics, he's a young adult, and um, I said to him, I said, listen, there's going to be a lot of people that you'll meet that you know that you have ultimately the best argument and the best idea and the best insight. But all they want to do is just have an argument with you. They're not listening. The yeah. difference is when you find someone that is seeking and when you find someone that is seeking, that's where I, I think apologetics is the perfect match. Like I am the recipient of apologetic work as a convert. I loved apologetics. I wanted to know why do you believe what you believe? But previous to that seeking, I thought Catholics were flipping crazy. There's no, <laughs> they were all adult. In fact, I used to put gospel tracts on their car windshields while they were at mass. So I mean, I mean, I'm not having a conversation with you. You can think you're right. All, I mean, but all you guys are worshiping idols in the first place, right? <laughs> it's it's such bizarre. I usually tell people, A, you're either reinforcing people's misconceptions and stereotypes about Catholicism, or B, you're standing in direct opposition to their misconceptions and stereotypes, you know? And so when you when you figure out a way to reach into another person's life and care about them. This is what I tell people. You have to be willing to love and care about someone, even if they accept or do not accept your apologetic. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Because it's the human person. They're a human person worthy of that dignity and respect. And we talked about that whole idea in the beginning with gender, you know, fluidity and this kind of bizarre changing of terms and all of that. They don't care what your morality is. So yeah. you can't start with the presupposition that we're speaking the same language. You're not. You have to basically show them that they matter to you no yeah. matter what. Do yeah. you care about them? Yes or no? I, I've seen people that are so excited for Judgment Day so people can get what they're due. I'm thinking to myself, I don't think that's how this is supposed to work. I think we're supposed to love people. You know, Jesus Christ loves that person who's identifying um, as they or as transgender or as gay or as a lesbian. I mean, you know what? The, at the end of the day is I want to find a way to, to, to get an end, to show someone I love them so that they can want what I've got. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I ran into this myself, um, you know, because I the, the first night, the three night parish mission, the first night I invited, bring your friends from work, you know, bring people in, and, and tell them to bring their Bibles. Well, a guy did exactly that, went to work the next day, invited two Protestant friends to come to the talk. 
they came, they brought their, I said, open your Bibles. And there's a process, open their Bibles. And I, I used a lot of scripture that particular night. And so afterward, they came up and introduced themselves to me. They told me they weren't Catholic, but their friend invited them. They said, I didn't know that Catholics knew so much of the Bible. And we were having this great conversation. The same people started gathering around us. They're like, get them, Deacon. Tell them about, you know, convince them to become Catholic. I'm like, no, no, that's not the point. I'm just glad that they're here. I'm inviting them to come back. I'm trying to get a dialogue. I'm not trying to, you know, convince them to be Catholic. That, that, no, that's not where they, you have to, we talk about meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm just having a conversation. This is the first time I'm meeting these. I'm grateful that they're even there, that they brought their yeah. Bibles, you know? And that's how you, you know, you have to build relationship and conversation, not just smash people over the head. Uh, with yeah. with the faith, I, I don't think that's a you know. And some people say, so they won't like that approach, Chris, because they, oh, it's too soft. It's too soft, you know. Um, and I, I think you know when you when you come off too hard, you push people further away. Now you've accomplished nothing. Right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's I, that's the question I keep asking: is what's your end game? Like, what is the the goal? What's the fruit of of what you're doing? What if you you know, what is it? And if it's their conversion, then ask the question of what you're doing is actually making a difference. And here's the problem. Yeah. I think some people have this weird idea that if I'm aggressive in my truth and the presentation of truth, then I've done my job. Then I'm yeah. done. Wash my hands of it. There you go. You have it. Now you can make your decision or not. But that's not the way that Jesus has ever wooed any of us. He he reaches us when we're broken and when we've been, you know, that prodigal son who's wandered away or when we basically uh, turned our, our backs on God. I mean, the truth is, is that our story has been up and down and all over. And the tenaciousness, that hound of heaven of God pursuing us. And there has to be a willingness and an interest in um, in us. I think I like to call it, we need a holy curiosity for the human person where we really are interested in who they are, their story, their journey. Yes. And so that we can earn the right to share the deepest part of who we are. I love that. I couldn't agree with you more. You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Berg Sivers. You're listening on the EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network. We're talking with Catholic evangelist, speaker, and author Chris Paget. And Chris, I want to make sure that we hit a couple of things here. Tell us about the Happy Place Homestead YouTube <laughs> channel and you're involved. Like you, like, like me, you're involved in so many other projects, you know. So but I want to make sure I want to talk about two things. This is the first one, the Happy Place Homestead. Homestead on YouTube. Tell us about that. So uh, real fast, we we live on a little homestead here in central New York, and we decided to do our little farming kind of thing. And we began to do some videos and put some things up. And we had a friend of ours who recorded what in essence became like a little reality show. And we did like eight episodes or something. It was awesome. And uh, we ended up getting a showrunner. So an actual showrunner signed a contract with us and they began to shop us to every major network. This was around 2019. And we ended up um, getting seen by, you know, Magnolia when it was getting ready to start launching its new channel. And you talk about the learning channel and discovery and fill in the blank. Everybody saw it and they loved it. And then um, 2020 happened. And so they shelved everything. And so for the last couple of years, we kind of got out of that contract and sat back and really took a, a sigh of relief and thought maybe this is the best. Because at the end of the day, the only complaint that we heard was one, somebody said they're too perfect of a family because ultimately what they want is drama. And yeah. I said, I am not going to sign any contract with any major network if I have to fake drama. There's enough real life craziness in our family where we don't have to make it up. So um, EWTN at one point it expressed possibly a little interest. We'll see. But we still have the videos up there. And there's a story called Sarah's story where we talk a little bit about my daughter and her unexpected pregnancy and the way we as a family that's very pro-life uh, rallied around her. Our little granddaughter's um, nine years old and she's in our area and uh, we get spoiled rotten by her all the time. So there's some real heart wrenching and meaningful videos, but there's some really fun little farming videos too. So that's the that's still there, and hopefully we'll still be putting some stuff out. All right, I want to make sure I also hit your, your new project, the Chris and Linda Show, which is a a podcast for married couples. I'd lo love to hear about that. 
So we're super passionate about marriage. We believe that marriages can be better than people think or imagine. But the truth is, is that marriages are in a crisis. I have a friend of mine, he said, you know, we have a crisis, of course, with the need for priests. But I'll tell you, um, this is how we're going to solve that crisis is um, he goes, we have a crisis and it's it's marriage. And um, and I said, this is how we're going to solve our vocations crisis. We need holy marriages. So that's what we focus on. And um the truth is you can go to chrisandlindapaget.com and find more information on how to bring us in for marriage retreats. We do all the pre-cana prep for couples getting married for the Diocese of Newark and Syracuse, New York, and we do marriage ministry all over the world. Chris and Linda Paget has some videos. You can check those out. But the podcast comes out in about a month. It's going to be amazing and hilarious and awesome. <laughs> so we're pumped. We love it. Oh, that's so great. That's so, I, Chris, man, I, I tell you, it's been such a joy having you on the program uh, to, to talk about your, your, your story um, and how you, how God has called you to step out in faith, to bring the truth and beauty of the Catholic faith to so many people around the world, especially strengthening marriage and family life through uh, the Chris and Linda show. So, uh, uh, God, it's great to be with you, man. And I hope to have you back on again sometime soon. Thank you. Love it. All right. Well, uh, the t tomorrow's show, we're gonna, it's Word of God Wednesday. We're going to break open Proverbs chapter 7. And remember, you can stream today's show by visiting podcastcentralew10.com slash radio. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.